Now that you know how to work with instance attributes, we will dive into class attributes. A class attribute is an attribute of the class. Class attributes belong to the class, not to a particular instance. Previously, instance attributes belong to the actual object that we were creating. But now, class attributes belong to the class. So all instances share this attribute, and they take their value from the same source. All instances of the class have access to this attribute, and they share the same value. So any changes made to this value affects all instances. That is something that you really have to be aware of when you decide to make an attribute a class attribute. Any changes that you make to the value affects all instances. For example, if we have a class attribute defined in our class and we change it, all instances are affected because they take the value from the same source. Class attributes are usually written or defined before the init method in a class. This is the basic structure of the class. You will learn how to define them in the coming video. So I'll see you there. Let's see how you can define class attributes in your Python classes. This is the basic syntax. It is very similar to a simple assignment statement that we use when we assign a value to a variable. We write the name of the attribute followed by an equal sign, which is the assignment operator, and then the value that we want to assign to the attribute. Remember that they are usually defined before the init method in the class and they have to be indented to be part of the class. This indentation right here would be four spaces or one tap, but it is recommended to use four spaces according to the Python style guide. Think about how you would define a species class attribute for a doc class based on the syntax that you just learned. Research the species of a dog and define this attribute in the class. Try to do this and then move on to the next video to check your work. We will write this in our code. Welcome back and welcome to this example. In this case, we are going to define a doc class with a species class attribute. First, let's write the part of the class that you're already familiar with, like the class header, which has the class keyword and the name of the class. And right here, we are going to write the init method to define some instance attributes to make the class a little bit more realistic. Let's define a name, then the age, and then the breed of the dog, okay? Now, how are we going to define our class attribute? We said that class attributes are typically written or defined before the init method. So what do we have to do? We just Click right here, click enter, we add a few blank lines between the class header and the init method, and right here in the middle, we write our class attribute. We say species is equal to the value that we want to assign. Doc species is canis lupus. We can confirm this. If we go to, for example, Wikipedia, we search for dog, we click on this article right here, and then we reach the article and right here you can see that the species of a dog is C. lupus. If you hover over this link right here, you will see right here that we have Canis lupus. So we are going to write that in our code right here. So now we have our class attribute. All dog instances that we create from this class will have this attribute. It will be shared because it belongs to the class, not to a particular instance. These attributes belong to the instance, name, age, and breed. But this attribute, you can see that we are not using self anywhere in this line. We are not using self because we don't need the instance. This attribute only belongs to the class. And this value is shared across all instances of the class. Great, so now let's go to our second example. We're going to continue working with our backpack class, but now we are going to add a class attribute. We're going to specify the maximum number of items that we can have in a backpack. Let's define the init method and the items attribute, which is initially an empty list. Now, how can we add a class attribute to the class? We just 
add a few blank lines right here and in the middle we just define the attribute we say the maximum number of items that we can have in the backpack is equal to let's say 10. Let's say that this is the maximum number of items that we want to set for the backpack. If we do this, all the backpack instances that we create will have a maximum number of items attribute with the value 10. And if we change or modify this value, they will all be affected by the change. Okay? You can see that we don't have self anywhere in this line because we are not using or referring to the instance. We are just writing an attribute that belongs to the class. Awesome! Now you know how to add class attributes to your classes. Great work so far! When you're ready, go to the next video to continue learning more about class attributes and how you can work with them. You can access class attributes using dot notation. And this is very helpful because we can work with their values and use them in our code. From outside of the class, we just need to write the name of the class followed by a dot and then the name of the attribute. Let's see an example. Right here we have our dot class with the species class attribute. Let's see how we can access this attribute outside of the class. This is the class definition. So if we don't indent our code, that code will not be part of the class. It will just be part of the main program. So what are we going to do? We are going to print the value of this attribute, the species attribute. And how can we access it? Well, we use the syntax that you just learned. First, we write the name of the class, which is dog. And then we write the name of the attribute, species. Right here, we are using dot notation. We are specifying the name of the class and then we are using a dot to specify the attribute right here after the dot. We say access the species attribute of the dot class. So let's save the file and run our code to see the output. Right here you can see this. The output is canis lupus, exactly what we have right here, the value of the species attribute of the dot class. So you can use the syntax not just to print the value, you can use it anywhere in your program where you need to. Now you know how to access class attributes outside of the class. Now inside the class, if we have to refer to this attribute, we just use the same syntax. The class name followed by a dot and then the name of the attribute. Great, let's see an example of how we can use class attributes inside the class. Now in this example, we're going to define a movie class. Right here we have two instance attributes, title and rating. But we also want to add a third instance attribute called ID. We're going to add this right here. And what will be the value of the ID? Well, we want each movie to have a unique identifier. For example, when we add the first movie to the system, we want the movie's ID to be 1. Then the second movie should have an ID of 2, and so on. How can we do this? How can we get a unique number and increment it each time that we create a movie instance? Let's see. We could define a class attribute that will serve as a counter, like this. We will just call it, for example, ID counter, and initialize its value to 1. This attribute belongs to the movie class, not to the instances, so this will be shared across all instances. How can we assign this value, this value of this attribute, to the instance attribute? Well, we just use the syntax that you learned. The name of the class followed by the name of the attribute. Right here, we are taking the value of the counter of the movie class and we are assigning it to the ID attribute of the instance. We're basically taking the current value of the counter and assigning it to the instance. But there is a small issue right here. What happens if we don't update this value? Then all the movies will have the same ID. So for that, what we can do is something that you will learn in the coming video in more detail, but we can update this value. We take the counter of the movie class and we can increment it by one each time that we create an instance. First, we assign it to the attribute ID and then we increment it by one.
That way, when we create our first movie, this value will be 1. Then it will be updated, and for the second instance, it will be 2. Then for the third instance, it will be 3, and so on. Let's see how this works in detail by creating movie instances. For example, let's say my movie. We say movie, title, sense and sensibility, and with a rating, for example, of 4.5. And then let's say your movie. Let's say, for example, Legends of the Fall with a rating of 4.7. What can we do with these two instances? Let's check the value of their IDs, okay? To see if we have exactly what we expected. Each movie instance should have its own unique ID because we are keeping track of a counter that will be incremented each time that we create a movie instance. For this movie, the ID should be 1. For this movie, the ID should be 2. Because right here, we are assigning that updated value to the instance attribute. We are assigning a class attribute to an instance attribute. So if we print these two values, let's see the output. We see exactly what we expected, 1 and 2. This movie's ID is 1, and this movie's ID is 2. And this is an example of how you can combine the power of class attributes with instance attributes. Class attributes are shared across all instances, and instance attributes are independent for each instance that we create. Awesome! Now you know how to access class attributes outside and inside of the class. And we also had a quick preview of how you can update a class attribute. When you're ready, go to the next video, and I'll see you there. Welcome to this example. Now we will work with our backpack class. We will define a class attribute and we will review all the principles of class attributes with this example. First of all, let's define a class attribute max number of items, like we did in a previous video. And real quick, let's define the init method with the empty list of items that we initially have for each backpack instance. This is our class at the moment. So what are we going to do? We're going to create two instances of backpack. My backpack and your backpack. After we have our two instances, let's confirm that they actually have this attribute, max number of items. Because we said that all the instances that we create from the class will share this attribute and they will all take it from the same source. So let's confirm this. Print my backpack dot max number of items and your backpack dot max number of items. Let's save the file and run the code. Right here, we can see this as the output, exactly what we expected. We see the value 10 for the two instances. Right here, we have the my backpack instance and your backpack instance. They both have a max number of items attribute that we defined right here, and the value is 10 for both instances. They share the same value. Let's also check that we can access this attribute just by using the name of the class, like you learned in the previous lectures. Let's see. We write the name of the class, which is backpack, and then right here we specify the name of the attribute. If we save the file and we run the code, right here we see that all three values are exactly the same, the value 10. So we can access this attribute through an instance or through the class directly. Why can we do this? Why can't we just write the name of the class and then the attribute? Well, because the attribute belongs to the class, not to a particular instance. All instances of the class will have this attribute but it is not necessary to have an instance. We can just access it with the name of the class. And this is what we usually do when we are working with a class attribute. Awesome, now you know how class attributes work and how to access them inside and outside of the class and you've practiced these principles with an example. Now you will learn how to modify the value of these attributes because sometimes you will need to update them. For example, let's say that you were designing a larger backpack that has, for example, 15 as the maximum number of items. 
you will need to update that in your code and you can do that. That is what you will learn in the coming videos. You can modify the value of a class attribute. Let's see how you can do this. You have to analyze this carefully before updating a class attribute because changing the value of a class attribute will definitely affect all instances of the class because they take that value from the same source. So if you change the value at the source, they will all be affected. This is the syntax. First, we write the name of the class. Then we write a dot, then the name of the class attribute that we want to update and the new value after the assignment operator, the equal sign. As you can see, this is very similar to assigning a value to a variable. But right now, with the dot and the name of the attribute, we are specifying which attribute we want to update. You had a quick preview of this syntax in the last lecture, but let's see an example in detail so you can review this. Let's start by writing a circle class, like this. We're going to assign the class attribute radius, which will be equal to 5. This will result in that all the instances of circle will share this value. They will all have the same radius, and if we update this radius, they will all change, okay? So right here, let's also define the init method, and let's just assign a color for the circles. So we can work with instance attributes and with class attributes in the same class. Let's see how we can update this value, but first let's check that this value is what we want the value to be. Let's print the value of circle.radius. Save the file, we run the code, and right here we see the value 5, which is exactly what we wrote in our class. So this is correct. Now let's create two instances, okay? My circle and your circle. Right here, we have to specify the color of the circle. Let's say blue, and right here, let's say green. We have our two instances. Let's confirm that they both have a radius attribute with these lines of code. Okay, we're printing the value of their attribute like this. And we can confirm that indeed these values are all equal. The radius class attribute is equal to 5. And each one of the instances has that attribute radius and it is equal to 5. Now, let's see what happens if we try to update the class attribute, like this. We write the name of the class followed by the name of the attribute, and then we assign the new value to the attribute. Previously, it was 5, and now it will be 10, okay? Let's see the effect that this has on the instance attribute. What are we going to do? Well, we are going to print the radius again using the class, and we are also going to print the value of the radius for each one of the instances. So you will see that the radius changed for the class and for each one of the instances because they all take the value from the same source. Now let's save the file and run the code. And right here you can see how the values changed. Let me resize this so you can see this a little bit better. Right here we have our initial values, 5. These are the result of this print statement and these two print statements. And then we update the value of the radius in the circle class to 10. After that, we have these three print statements and we can see that the value was updated for the class and for each one of the instances that we created with the class. Awesome, so now you know how to update class attributes outside of the class. And we use the same syntax to update a class attribute inside of the class. The class name followed by a dot, the name of the attribute, an equal sign, and finally, the value. Now let's see another example. But first, please take a moment to think about how you can update a class attribute price of a pizza class. Let's say that in our store, all pizzas have the same price. So we want to define price as a class attribute to make all instances share this value. Think about this, pause the video, and then come back so we can start writing the code. Now let's go to our second example, which will be a pizza class. Let's write the class header, class pizza. 
we said that we wanted to add or define a class attribute named price because we have a brand new store and we've decided that all pizzas in our store will cost exactly the same. So let's say that we assigned a price of $12.99 and the clients can have as many toppings as they wish for that fixed price. That would be really awesome, right? So after that, we're going to create the init method. What are we going to assign as instance attributes? Well, each pizza will have a description, will have a list of toppings, and will have a type of crust. Awesome, so we just have to create this instance attribute, self.description, self.toppings. We use these parameters right here, and self.crust. We have our class already defined with a class attribute price. Typically, in a typical store, this would be an instance attribute because each pizza would have its own unique price based on the toppings and based on the type of pizza. But right now, we are simulating this scenario where all pizzas on our store have a fixed price. And if we change this price, all pizzas will be affected. Okay, so what are we going to do? We are going to confirm that the price attribute is indeed $12.99. Let's save the program. And right here we see the output. $12.99 is the value of the class attribute price of the pizza class. So now let's create a pizza instance. We say my pizza will be a pizza of type margarita. It will have basil and mushrooms. And the crust will be New York style. This is really delicious. What are we going to do with that instance? We are going to confirm that the price of that pizza instance is really $12.99. So let's save the file and run our code. And right here we can see that it is $12.99. Okay, so now we're going to update our class attribute. Let's say that at some point in our program, we need to update that value. How can we do that? Well, we just write the name of the class, which is pizza. And then we write the name of the attribute, price. We're going to change this from $12.99 to $13.99. Okay? We are incrementing the price of our pizzas by $1 because our store was really, really successful. After that, what are we going to do? We are going to print again the value of price for the pizza class and the value of that attribute for the instance that we just created to confirm that they are the same and that the price was updated successfully. Let's save the file and run our code, and right here we can see this. We see the old price, which is the output from these two print statements, and we also see the new price, $13.99. This line updated the price, and right here we have the two print statements that print these two values. Awesome, now you know how to define, access, and modify class attributes in Python. Remember that this value is shared across all instances, and if you change this value, all instances will be affected. Welcome to this practical example where we will review the principles that you learned about class attributes in Python. We're going to use, as an example, our backpack class with the attribute maximum number of items. Let's say that we initially defined this to be 10. 10 items is the maximum number of items that our backpacks can contain. Okay, so what are we going to do first? We are going to check that this attribute has indeed the value 10. So we're going to print it. We access it outside of the class with the name of the class, followed by a dot and then the name of the attribute. If we save the file and we run the code, we see that this value is indeed 10. After that, we are going to create an instance, my backpack, right here. And we are going to check if this instance has a maximum number of items attribute and that its value is 10. Since you learned that class attributes are shared and they take the value from the same source, which is the class. And indeed, that is exactly what happens. The instance automatically has this attribute and the value is 10 like we assigned right here. Awesome, we checked that things are working as we expected, but now let's say that we want to make our backpacks have 
a greater capacity. Let's say that now the maximum number of items will be 15. We can do that by writing the name of the class followed by the name of the attribute and then the new value, which is 15. After this line, the value will be updated. So to check that, we are going to write two print statements again. To check that this attribute, when we try to access it with the class, has the value 15, and when we try to access it with the instance. They should both have the same value. And right here you can see that this works as we expected. Initially, the capacity was 10, 10 items. And after we run this line, we have a maximum number of items equal to 15. Okay, all the instances that we create from the class in our program will be affected or impacted by this change because they take this value from the same source, which is the class. Great work so far. Now you know how to work with class attributes in Python, how they work, how to access them, and how to modify them both inside and outside of the class. Welcome to this section. Now you will learn two basic pillars of object-oriented programming, encapsulation and abstraction. Let's start with encapsulation. Encapsulation is one of the main pillars of object-oriented programming. It is the bundling of data and methods that act on that data into a single unit. This unit is called a class. So the class acts like a capsule that holds the attributes and the methods of the object, and it separates them or kind of isolates them from the rest of the program because they are part of this larger unit called a class. The purpose of the class or the purpose of this larger unit that contains these elements is to be able to restrict access to these elements, following the principle of information hiding. This capsule that is made by the class serves as a shield because its goal is to prevent direct access to the attributes and to the data of the object in order to avoid making potentially problematic changes to its state. So basically, we only let the outside world, the rest of the program, see what we wanted to see of the class or of the object. We can only see public members of the class. We only see what the developer of the class chose to make public. And we can choose to make some elements not public, so they are kept safely within the class, without any external access. This is the core of the principle of encapsulation. Getters and setters are methods, specific methods, that help us follow this principle by protecting the data and providing an indirect way to access that data. You will learn more about them in this section, and you will also learn about properties, which are the way we implement getters and setters in Python. Making members of a class public and non-public helps us to preserve their integrity and keeps them safe because we can choose which elements are public so that they can be accessed from outside of the class and which members are non-public and shouldn't be accessed outside of the class. They should only be accessed within the class and they are restricted to live and work within the capsule. Awesome, now you know why we have public and non-public attributes. So please take a moment to analyze why it is important to avoid making unexpected changes to an attribute. Think of an example of an attribute that shouldn't be modified unexpectedly. Think about the consequences of changing it to an invalid value and analyze why it might be helpful to make this attribute non-public so it can only be accessed within the capsule, within the class. Think about this and when you're ready, go to the next video to continue learning about these basic pillars of object-oriented programming. Now let's see the principle of abstraction and what this principle is all about. It is one of the basic pillars of object-oriented programming. And it basically states that we should show only the essential attributes of a class or of an object only the essential members and hide unnecessary details from the user of the class in this case. So this principle lets us hide the complexity of the internal implementation of the class from the user. For example, having a real-world analogy when you use a smartphone, 
You use the graphical user interface that developers created for you to interact with the phone, like buttons and elements, that let you use the phone in a user-friendly way. You don't need to understand all the complex details or steps that occur behind the scenes in the electronic device when you actually use your phone. So this is an example of abstraction in the real world. The same happens with a car. When you turn on a car with the key, you don't actually know what is happening behind the scenes in the engine. And you don't need to, because engineers created a way for users to just use the key and the wheel to drive the car without knowing the internal complexity of the engine. This is another example of abstraction, in the real world, of course, and we are taking that concept and applying it to software development. A class has two main parts, an interface and an implementation. We can sort of divide the class into these two parts. The interface is the visible part of the class that the program can interact with. It is basically what we choose to show from that capsule. Now the implementation is the other part, the internal part of the class with the code that performs the functionality behind the scenes. It is the actual code that makes all the functionality of the class work. If we use the analogy of a car, the wheel would sort of be like its interface with the user. And the engine would be the actual implementation of the class. In the class, we choose to expose only the members that should be exposed. And all other members are non-public, so they cannot or should not be accessed from outside of the class. We sort of like create a black box, where the user of the class knows how to interact with that box, but doesn't know the details of the internal implementation. He or she only knows the effect that the box will have. This way, we are hiding the implementation from the user, and we can change it without affecting how the user interacts with a member of the class. We are not affecting the program at all if we change the internal implementation, but not the interface with the user. The users, or anywhere else in the program where we use the class, will still be kept intact, but we can change the internal implementation. The principle of abstraction also allows us to abstract out common parts of the code to avoid repetition. This is another part of the principle, another aspect of this principle. We can abstract out common parts of the code to avoid code repetition by using abstractions or representations of more abstract objects. For example, if we need to define two classes in our program, Poodle and Schnauzer, these are both dog breeds. So they will have a lot of repeated code because they will have similar attributes because they are both dogs and functionality. Instead of writing these two classes and repeating the code in both of them, we can create a new class called dog with the shared attributes of these two classes. This class would, of course, be more abstract in nature, and it would be reusable. So if we ever need to represent another dog breed in our program, we could do it without code repetition. These two classes would inherit that is how we call this inherit, and you will learn more about inheritance during the course, but they will inherit the attributes and the functionality of this general class, and they would reuse that code without us having to write it explicitly in these two classes. This is the principle of abstraction. You can see that it is very helpful because we hide the internal complexity of the class from the user and we can avoid code repetition. Please take a moment to analyze why abstraction can be helpful. And when you're ready, go to the next video. I will see you there. Public and non-public attributes play a key role in object-oriented programming because they help us follow the principle of encapsulation. By making some attributes public and others non-public, we can restrict the access to these elements and protect them from unexpected changes. We will be following the principle of information hiding. In Python, attributes can be either public or non-public. A public attribute is an attribute that can be accessed and modified directly without any access restrictions. So we can access and modify it anywhere in our program. Let's see an example in our code. 
So far, we have been defining public attributes in our classes. So let's start by defining our car class. We're going to represent cars with a brand, a model, and a year. All of these attributes are public. Let's create a car instance. The model will be 911 Carrera and the year will be 2020. Awesome, that is a really beautiful car, right? So let's see if we can get or access outside of the class the year of the car. Let's save the file and run our code. And indeed we can, it is 2020. So far so good, right? We can't define the attributes and we can access them. But let's see the risks of making an attribute public, completely public and accessible from anywhere in our program. Let's say that somewhere in our code, we write this line of code. We are actually updating the year of the car to 5,600. Right now, that would cause a serious bug in the system. Let's see if this update is allowed by the program. If we run the code, we see that before the change, the year was 2020, like we specified. But after we run this line, the year is now 5,600. So we have a futuristic car that was manufactured before this year. That is one of the risks of making an attribute completely public, that we can access it and modify it directly outside of the class without any validation. We cannot validate this value. We cannot check if it is appropriate for the attribute of our class. And that makes our code more error prone. We can make unexpected changes that affect our program. However, public attributes are really helpful as well when we do want to allow direct access to these attributes and modifications. Now that you know what public attributes are and how to work with them, let's go to non-public attributes. A non-public attribute is an attribute that shouldn't be accessed or modified outside of the class. We use the term non-public here because we are following the term that is used in the Python style guide. Usually you will not see the term private in Python because no attribute is ever really private in Python. And you will see why in just a moment in this section. So we will be commonly using this term non-public. In Python, we have two ways of defining a non-public attribute, by naming convention or by activating a mechanism that changes the attribute's name and makes it more difficult to access, called name mangling. When we use the naming convention, which is what we typically do, we just add a leading underscore to the name of the attribute. And this will immediately tell other developers visually that the attribute should be treated as non-public, so it shouldn't be accessed or modified directly outside of the class. We can also trigger this process of name mangling, of changing the name, by adding two underscores, two leading underscores, to the name of the attribute. This makes it more difficult for developers to access the name because we are actually changing the name during the process. You will learn how name mangling works in a specific lecture of this section. But you must know that the second alternative should only be used for special cases. So we typically work with and use the first alternative with one leading underscore. Let's see what the documentation has to say about non-public attributes in Python. If we go to the Python documentation, to the article that covers classes right here, we can click on this part, section 9.6, private variables, right here. It says, private instance variables that cannot be accessed except from inside an object don't exist in Python. This is what we mentioned. They actually do not exist. However, there is a convention that is followed by most Python code. A name prefixed with an underscore, like this. You can see that we have the name, and right here we have a leading underscore. This should be treated as a non-public part of the application programming interface, whether it's a function, a method, or a data member. It should be considered an implementation detail and subject to change without notice. So that is basically the message that you are sending to other developers when you add a leading underscore. You're telling them that this is part of the implementation 
and it is subject to change without notice. So they should not use it because that could break their code if you make any changes to that attribute. So remember, one leading underscore is a naming convention and two leading underscores triggers the process of name mangling and should only be used for special cases. Let's see an example. Right here we have the car class that we defined with the three public instance attributes. But we already saw the possible consequences of making an attribute public and something that is so important as the year and so restricted in the range of values that it can contain should probably be a little bit more protected from direct change. So how can we change this? How can we protect this attribute even further? Well, we can make it non-public or protected. We can do that by just adding a leading underscore to its name. Let's see how this changes the functionality of our code. If we add a leading underscore right here, we can still create the instance the same way as we did. This value will be assigned to this parameter and the value of this parameter will be assigned to the attribute year. But now the attribute year doesn't actually exist. We have a leading underscore before its name. So when we try to access it right here below, let's see what happens. We get a yellow warning that says, unresolved attribute reference year for class car. This is basically telling us, hey, this car, this object doesn't have a year attribute. So why are you writing this in your code? Well, let's see what happens if we save the file and we run the code. Now we see this error that says attribute error car object has no attribute year. So we know that the object doesn't have this attribute. Now it has a leading underscore. And this is like a red warning telling other developers that they shouldn't access this attribute outside of the class. I'm sure you must be asking yourself, why do we keep using the term non-public instead of private? If you've already learned how to work with other programming languages like Java, you will commonly see the term private, but right here we are using the term non-public. Well, according to the documentation, and I'm taking this literally from the documentation, the Python style guide. We don't use the term private here since no attribute is really private in Python. This is very important. No attribute is really private in Python. Technically, you can't access them, but you shouldn't. In Java, we have something called access modifiers that help us hide or determine where the attributes can be accessed, like public, protected, and private. But in Python, we don't have any access modifiers. So we rely on naming conventions to tell other developers that a member of a class, like an attribute or a method, is intended to be non-public. Awesome. Now you know how public and non-public attributes work in Python. So please think for a moment how you could access those non-public attributes outside of the class. I'll give you a hint. It's basically the same syntax, but we add a leading underscore to the name. Try to do this in our example, in our car class. Pause the video for a moment and then come back so we can start writing the code and working with these attributes. Technically, you can still access it if you add the leading underscore right here. But you will see a warning that says access to a protected member here of a class. PyCharm is reminding us that this shouldn't be accessed outside of the class. If we run the code, we will still see the value because we can technically access it, but we shouldn't according to the Python naming conventions. Welcome to this example. Now you'll practice defining non-public attributes in a Python class. We will define a student class in this case. We have write the class header and then we have to write the init method like this. In this case, we are going to take four parameters, the student ID, the name, the age, and the GPA or the grade point average. Let's define the instance attributes like we usually do self dot the name of the attribute. And then we assign the value of the parameter that we have right here. But let's say that we analyzed the class and we determined that the H attribute is an attribute that shouldn't be accessed or modified directly outside of the class. 
So how can we tell other developers that this attribute should not be accessed? Well, by using the naming convention that you just learned. We add a leading underscore to the name of the attribute, and we can immediately see the visual change in this list of attributes. We see the leading underscore, and this is like a red warning saying, please don't use this attribute outside of the class. So let's see how this impacts the code that we have been writing so far. We're going to create an instance of student, and we're going to store it in the variable student Nora. Okay, the first argument has to be the student ID. So 24, 5, A, F, S. Let's say that that is the student ID. And then we have the student's name, Nora Naf. For simplicity purposes, we're just writing it as a string, the full name. The age will be 15 and the GPA will be 3.96. Okay, so now we have our instance. Let's see if we can access the age attribute like we used to do in our previous examples. We use stop notation and right here we wrote the name of the attribute. But what do we see right here? We see a yellow warning that says unresolved attribute reference age for the class student. This is just saying that there isn't an age attribute in this class that is part of this object. So why are you writing this? Let's save the file and run the code to see the error that we get. We see this error. Attribute error, student object has no attribute h. And it points to this line. This line is the one that caused the error, where we try to access the h attribute. This attribute is not found, but what do we have to do to fix this? In theory, we shouldn't access this outside of the class. But to show you that in reality, no attribute is ever really private in Python, we can just add the leading underscore to the name of the attribute. And that will give us access to the attribute, but it will also show us a warning. Let's see. Right here, we see the value of the age, right? We have the value 15, which is exactly what we assigned as the age of this instance. But we also see a warning right here that says access to a protected member age of a class. We are receiving that warning because even though we are technically allowed to access that attribute, we shouldn't access it in our program. So PyCharm is reminding us of this rule. Awesome, now you know how to define non-public attributes with a leading underscore and how this impacts how you can access the attribute in the class. You know that you shouldn't access this attribute outside of the class. You will receive a warning. Technically, you can do it, but you shouldn't. The developer is telling you that this is only meant to be used inside the class. Now let's see another example of how you can define non-public attributes in Python. In this case, we're going to continue working with our backpack class, and we are going to define our init method with the initially empty list of items. But let's say that we want to protect this attribute. We don't want the list of items to be accessed or modified outside of the class directly. So what do we do? We just add a leading underscore right here. And we're already visually telling users of our class that they shouldn't access this attribute. How can we check that this attribute is actually protected? Well, we can create an instance like this of backpack. And let's see what happens if we try to access the attribute like we did, just by writing the name of the attribute. Well, we see that it turns yellow and we see the warning unresolved attribute reference items for class backpack. This is just telling us, hey, this object doesn't even have an items attribute. So why are you writing this in your code? Let's see the error that we get if we try to run the code. Right here we see attribute error backpack object has no attribute items. It doesn't have this attribute and if we add a leading underscore, we will be able to access it, but we shouldn't. Let's see if we can technically. Yes, we can. We see the empty list right here, but we see a warning from PyCharm. Access to a protected member items of a class. This is warning us that we shouldn't access this element outside of the class. So now you know how to make this attribute protected or non-public in your class. Awesome, so let's see our next example. Now we will define a movie class just like we did in a previous example with an ID counter. 
we have a class attribute ID counter and in it, we will assign a unique ID for each movie. We will have these four instance attributes. And now we are going to define a fifth instance attribute called ID. We are going to take that ID from the class attribute, just like you learned when we covered class attribute. And we will update that class attribute every time that we create an instance right here. But don't you think that the ID of a movie is a very important attribute that shouldn't be accessed or modified outside of the class? It should at least not directly, because this could cause unexpected changes and bugs in our program. So what can we do to protect this attribute even further? Well, we can add this leading underscore to the ID. And there we are telling other users that the ID should only be used within the class and it shouldn't be changed, modified or accessed directly. Let's see how this works by creating two movie instances. My movie, let's say Pride and Prejudice in 2005 in English with a rating of 4.7. And then your movie, Sense and Sensibility, from 1995, in English, and let's say a rating of 4.6. This movie should have an ID of 1, and this movie should have an ID of 2. But let's see if we can access the ID. Let's see what we get. Now, in both of these cases, we see a yellow warning that says Unresolved Attribute Reference ID for Class Movie. This is because the objects do not have an ID attribute. What do they have? Well, they have this protected attribute right here, or non-public attribute. What we can do technically to access them is adding a leading underscore, but you shouldn't. I am just showing you that technically you can, but you shouldn't, and even PyCharm is warning you, access to a protected member ID of a class. If we run the code, we see their IDs, one and two and we are adding that extra layer of protection by adding this leading underscore. We're telling other users that this attribute should not be used outside of the class. Great, so now you know how to define non-public attributes with a leading underscore. Great work so far. When you're ready, go to the next video so you can continue learning more about these principles. Welcome back. Do you remember that we mentioned the term name mangling just a few lectures ago? Well, now you're going to learn what this is all about. When we add two leading underscores, right here we have two underscores, to the name of an attribute or a member of a class, then the process of name mangling is triggered. It starts. This is a process by which the name of the attribute or of the member of the class is modified. What happens behind the scenes is this right here. The name of the attribute, which we have right here with the two leading underscores, is transformed through the process of name mangling into this. A combination of an underscore, the name of the class, two underscores, and then the name of the attribute. This is the basic format of the name of the attribute after the process of name mangling. So we're sort of like hiding the attribute even further. By convention, we just add one leading underscore, but when we add two leading underscores, we transform that name into this, which makes it even more difficult to access it. But it should only be used for special cases. Let's see what we can learn about this in the documentation. If we go to the Python documentation to the classes article and we click right here on private variables, we can learn more about name mangling. Particularly, we have to focus on this paragraph right here. Since there is a valid use case for class private members, namely to avoid name clashes of names with names defined by subclasses, this refers to something called inheritance, which you will learn more about in a coming section. But for now, just focus on the fact that we are creating class private members. There is limited support for a mechanism called name mangling. Any identifier of the form, this form right here, which is the name of the attribute and two leading underscores with at least two leading underscores and at most one trailing underscore is textually replaced with this that we have right here. 
what you just learned. The name, the original name, is transformed into this. A name that contains a leading underscore, the name of the class, and two underscores followed by the name of the attribute. Where class name is the current class name with the leading underscore stripped. This mangling is done without regard to the syntactic position of the identifier, as long as it occurs within the definition of a class. So, if we have this attribute in a class engine serial number, and we add two leading underscores to its name, the process of name mangling is triggered to transform it into this right here. A leading underscore followed by the name of the class, two underscores, and then the name of the attribute but it should only be used for special cases, okay? However, you can still access this attribute outside of the class, which is why the documentation says that no attribute is ever really private in Python. Please take a moment to think about how you can access this attribute. Remember that you shouldn't, but it is still possible technically with the new name. Pause the video and then come back so we can start writing the code. We're going to illustrate how the process of name mangling works with our backpack class. We define the class with the init method and our initial list of items. But now, instead of adding just one leading underscore, we are going to add two leading underscores to the name of the attribute. You can see that right here we have one and two leading underscores. After we have that, we know that it will not exist as an attribute with this name it will exist with the new name that was assigned. We shouldn't access this attribute outside of the class, but I'm just going to show you this so you know that we can technically still access it, but we shouldn't. We're going to create an instance called my backpack, and then we are going to try to print the value of the items attribute of the instance. You can see that there isn't an items attribute for this object. So if we run the code, we see that backpack object has no attribute items. How can we access this attribute then? If we add one leading underscore, we still see the error. If we add two leading underscores, we still see the error. So just by writing the same name that we wrote right here, we cannot access that attribute. If we run the code, we see that the backpack object has no attribute items. The name has been changed due to the process of name mangling. So how can we access that attribute? Well, we need to add one leading underscore and then write the name of the class. After we write the name of the class, we need to write two underscores and the name of the attribute. Now, if we save the file and we run the code, you can see this right here. You can see the empty list that is the value that we assign to items. This name was changed to this name right here. Really awesome, right? So we can add some values right here to confirm that we are actually accessing this value in the output. We have a water bottle and a first aid kit. Let's run the code and we see this value. Water bottle and first aid kit. We are accessing this value with a different name for the attribute. We add a leading underscore followed by the name of the class, two underscores, and then the name of the attribute. Awesome, right? You can technically access it, but you shouldn't. Remember that you shouldn't. When a developer adds two leading underscores or even one leading underscore, this is a red warning, a red sign that tells you, please do not access or modify this attribute in your program. It is only meant to be used internally within the class. Finally, you have to know that name mangling is triggered when we add two leading underscores and a maximum of one trailing underscore after the name of the attribute. Adding two trailing underscores to the name of the attribute has a special meaning, so it doesn't actually trigger name mangling. This is reserved for something called magic methods or special methods, which you will learn more about in the coming sections. Great, so now you know how name mangling works behind the scenes and that you should only use it for special cases. We usually rely on one leading underscore to define a non-public attribute. 